Thanks. Uh, thanks for being here, and thank you for that very kind introduction. I know it's a nice day out, and N.K. Jemison is speaking, uh, so um, kind of uh, timely that way. So yeah, this is the book uh, here. It's got a nice piece of art on the cover by a local artist, uh, Stiller Zussman, uh, who's a really wonderful artist. Um, so adventure capitalism, I just wanted to basically give you a sense of what I wanted to do in the book uh, and what some of the uh, guiding principles are of the book and then speak briefly a little bit about the chapters. Um, so there we go. Uh, so uh, a few things about it. I want to get a number of things out of the way right off the bat. And that's Jeff Bezos's rocket, Elon Musk, and... Death and Robots, if you watch Netflix, Love, Death and Robots is fabulous uh, and, and has uh, some, some relevance here. This is the kind of stuff I'm not talking about because uh, including also things like, you know, uh, artificial intelligence and singularity, right? The, the moment in which um, artificial intelligence surpasses uh, humankind's capacity for processing and takes over. Um, or uploading one's consciousness to a computer mainframe and things like this. So that's the stuff I'm not interested in because that's the exact, what I call exaggerated exit. It gets a ton of attention um, and it's outside attention because these are really billionaire white male vanity projects. Uh, most of them are not gonna go anywhere. No one's going to Mars anytime soon for a long period of time. Um, these guys are not going to extend their lifespan that far. I mean, maybe a little bit farther than some of us, but so they're distractions and that's not what I wanted to talk about. Um, I really wanted to talk about much more mundane things that in their mundanity seem to me actually quite um, stress inducing um, and, and worrisome uh, for the future. I'll say a couple of things about libertarian and, and exit. I mean, by libertarian, what I'm referring to are, is, is a kind of thread of libertarianism and I see it as a big tent definition. Some people don't like this, it's totally fine, I understand, but my tent, big tent definition includes people who are on the spectrum of what you might call neoliberalism, so Milton Friedman, um, uh, Friedrich Hayek, uh, and then all the way to people who I think are probably more well situated in the classic uh, US and UK libertarian traditions, uh, like Ludwig von Mises, uh, Murray Rothbard, um, and the perennial uh, Ayn Rand. Um, very influential in the tech sector these days. Um, and so these are the people that I, they, they themselves ascribe uh, to these philosophies. These are the people they're reading, these are the people they're quoting, these are the people who they find inspiration in. And then by exit, I'm not talking about um, emigration, I'm not talking about um, expatriation. Uh, these are individuals who are really looking to actually create, it's a form of secession in which they're trying to create new countries or new polities or new communities in which they can work out different forms of governance, different forms of uh, ways of being and so on and so forth. So it's partially experimental and, and so forth, but, but I'm also hoping to convey to you that, that in some ways it's not experimental, that it's actually an age old story. Um, there's two aspects of the story that I wanna stress that kind of run through the book and guide some of, like I said, the, the basic principles. One is, um, what I just mentioned, which is that this is an age old story. You could have gone way back to things like the company states, to private colonization of Africa, contract in Southeast Asia, uh, capitalist uh, colonization in various parts of the globe. I mean, this is a story that, that has a long lifespan to it and it connects up to ideas about dispossession, colonization, primitive accumulation. Uh, and the like. I don't go that far back. I go back to the 1960s, uh, but I at least wanted to go back in time somewhat because, again, I feel like the, the sort of exaggerated exit, it's not only what gets a lot of attention, but it's also the kind of thing, whether you're a critic or a fan, uh, there's always this seeming idea that somehow these great ideas just started in the brains of Silicon Valley and that there's not something here. Actually, it's very and I use this word purposefully uh, in the hopes that it rankles them, derivative. You know, it's derivative, uh, not to say plagiaristic. <laughs> um, but, uh, and then the second thing that, about the project that kind of runs through all the way is another um, uh, thing that was very important to me, which was the social histories of the places where these experiments take place. Uh, there's a lot of attention given to the, the sort of operationalizing of these kinds of projects and 
what's going on and who's involved and who's funding and, and so on and so forth. But there's so much less attention given to what's actually happening on the ground in a place like Vanuatu in the Southwest Pacific in the era of decolonization. What's happening in Barbados in 1970, or the Bahamas, sorry, excuse me, 1973, 1974, 1975, uh, and, and other places that I look at. So I spent a lot of time trying to reconstruct uh, the sort of social histories and political histories of the places where these projects unfolded because in, none of these succeed. They don't succeed, though, just because of the sort of arrogance and, and ignorance of the people involved. It, they also don't succeed because of people on the ground in these places, some who resisted, some who collaborated, um, all different kinds of things, but the, the sort of, you know, the real whiff of history uh, that I wanted to, to, to get at. Um, so I start with a little bit of a discussion in the book about what I mean by libertarian uh, and the, the kind of genealogy of ideas, and then I try to move relatively quickly into the book into these case studies of places uh, where these projects uh, played themselves out, especially starting in the 1960s. Um, the 1960s in some ways I think is, is kind of interesting in the sense that it in ways kind of mirrors our time. There's uh, um, a, you know, these enormous concerns that were on people's mind, fears about demographic collapse, right? the population bomb by Anne and Paul Ehrlich, a very famous text from 1968 filled with all kinds of wild scenarios about what was going to happen in the 1970s if population wasn't brought under control. Uh, make Room, Make Room by Harry Harrison. I mean, these are just scattershot examples. I mean, you could pull hundreds and just put this up on the screen. But uh, Harry Harrison's book, which was the basis, this was a 1964 book, what was the basis for what you might know better, which is Soylent Green, the movie with Charlton Heston, right? So Harrison's, which is also about sort of overpopulation and, and the inability to feed the planet, uh, the Malthusian sci-fi. Um, Stuart Brand's Whole Earth Catalog. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's an interesting connection here between the counterculture and cyberculture that Fred Turner has written about very tellingly. Um, but you have these fears about demographic collapse, about uh, ecological collapse. Garrett Hardin's 1968 tragedy, The Commons, um, which was very sort of pronounced. You can think of, you know, the serialization of Dune by Frank Herbert. Um, you can even go back earlier to something like Neville Shoots on the Beach. Uh, so there's a whole array of, uh, of things like this. And then there's also concerns about monetary collapse. Um, and this was the era of the gold bugs. So the, you know, these were people who were invited. They, they were talking about going back to hard currencies uh, like gold and, uh, or hard monetary um, uh, programs of gold. And they would speak on the Phil Donahue show and so forth. They had a big audience. Uh, and these were people who were pushing very hard for uh, for uh, US to, uh, for the gold to be able to kind of fluctuate, right? And not to be uh, pegged the way it was pegged uh, starting in the Great Depression. Something like Ian Fleming's Goldfinger is all about, uh, right? The irradiation of gold in, in order to undermine uh, the, the British and US uh, economies. It's an era of decolonization in the Cold War, uh, which is also uh, very important. A lot of the people that I talk about were very clearly aware of the opportunities that something like decolonization would provide to them, that these were spaces where they could actually insinuate themselves into the process of decolonization and work the sort of political instability to their, uh, to their advantage. Um, the person I write about a lot in the book, this is from Innovator magazine. Innovator was one of the most prominent libertarian magazines produced in Los Angeles in the 1960s uh, by a guy named Tom Marshall, who went by the the nickname El Rey, uh, the king in Spanish. Um, and uh, this is an advertisement in the back here about, you know, have you prepared yourself for the coming monetary collapse? Uh, and if you hadn't, then you could prepare yourself by ordering coins from the Nevada Coin Exchange, which was run by a man named Michael Oliver. Uh, and Michael Oliver is someone who I follow quite closely in the book. He's the, he's the sort of guiding thread, but he's not the um, he's not the sole protagonist, but Oliver's story is very interesting and it gives you a sense of some of the dynamics of where these projects come from. Uh, he was born Moses Elitsky in Lithuania. Uh, he grew up in Kaunas, uh, Lithuania. Um, and at the age of 18, he was the only person in his family to survive the Holocaust. So uh, all of his family were murdered by the Nazis. He himself was put in two different concentration camps. Uh, he was rescued by Japanese American troops on the forced march to the Tyrol in 1945. Um, 
spent two years in a displaced persons camp and then came to the, the United States. Uh, and he set up, over time, he based himself out of Carson City, Nevada. Um, and Oliver's story is very interesting because he, uh, as a lot of people, I think there were other individuals who kind of shared this, um, this, this feeling. Uh, the 60s, there's a lot of projects like his projects that I'll talk about in just a second. The sense in which something was turning uh, in the United States and that the protests and the demonstrations and and so forth was, again, a kind of harbinger of, of totalitarianism on the rise, right? And that this was a world that would, you know, turn in just a moment in the way that it did for them in Lithuania uh, in the 1940s. So he starts making plans to uh, get out. That's what he wants to do, uh, as he wants to get out of the country. He wants to figure out how to do that. Um, and so I talk first about his first project, and I'll tell you a little bit about this, the age of Atlantis. Atlantis is, you know, you could, if you Googled this, you would find lots of references. Atlantis is the sort of um, uh, reference point par excellence for libertarians, right? So one of the points I make is the 1960s is remembered as the age of Aquarius and the new, le new left, but I really think it's the age of Atlantis and the rise of the libertarians, I think, actually. I mean, there's just so much material being produced. There's so much activity happening. There's so much think tank work going on um, and, and so forth. Um, and you get a number of different uh, projects that look at the ocean as a place where you can exit to, where you can escape to. That land, there's, no, there's no place to do this on land, right? Or if there is a place to do it, it's complicated. And so they start looking at oceans. Lester Hemingway, he Ernest Hemingway's younger brother. He tried to do this in the Caribbean in 1964. He uh, took a, a, a raft and he attached a um, Ford engine block to it and sank the engine block as an anchor off the coast of Jamaica in just in international waters um, and set up what he called the Republic of Atlantis. Uh, and you can see here he made a little stamp, New Atlantis. Uh, he made a currency. Uh, he made honorary, you know, letterhead uh, uh, and all this kind of stuff. He did a lot of wacky things on this ship uh, uh, that I won't talk about here, but that I go into detail a little bit in the book. Werner Stiefel was a pharmaceutical engineer, a soap engineer, uh, whose parents had also fled Nazi Germany. And uh, he was based in Saugerties in upstate New York and rented the Saugerties Motel off of I-87 and uh, turned it into a kind of little mini libertarian, libertarian think tank. And he would invite what he, people that he called immigrants, renters basically, uh, to come and stay at the hotel. And they would do uh, speaking engagements of various, various kinds and have people come and uh, speak. And then eventually they, uh, using a, um, a uh, geodesic dome uh, from Buckminster Fuller, uh, they built a ship that they were going to sail to the Bahamas and, and, and establish a kind of new Atlantis. Um, the ship caught fire and sank. Uh, they resuscitated it and managed to get down to the Bahamas and then uh, a hurricane promptly uh, sank it again. Uh, the most persistent effort though is Michael Oliver, as I mentioned. Um, you can see here the, the coins that they're making and things like this. Michael Oliver, this is the book he wrote, a little self-published book, A New Constitution for a New Country, in February of 1968. It sold so well that he released a second version at double the price in May uh, of 1968. Uh, there were a lot of people reading this book, uh, very wealthy industrialists, uh, investment specialists, and others uh, in the United States and in the UK and elsewhere who are reading this book, some of whom I talk about uh, in the book more generally, Willard Garvey, who was a very prominent wheat magnate in Wichita Falls, Kansas, who had a big World Homes uh, project built. He, he basically had a direct line to the head of the CIA at the time. Um, and he wrote him a letter in which he said, you know, in contrast to, you know, in response to Khrushchev's every man a communist, every man a capitalist, and the way to do that is to make him a homeowner. And so he had this whole project about building homes in Peru and elsewhere. He took anarchist ideas from people like Turner in the UK and then sort of reworked them into this idea of creating a world of capitalists through uh, home ownership. So Oliver's book was very prominent. This was essentially, it's a kind of introduction to his thinking and then the rest of it is essentially a constitution 
Um, and it's always, you know, this is always a, a, an interesting aspect about a lot of the libertarian writing of the time, which is it's a constitution essentially, essentially written and dictated by Michael Oliver. I mean, it's, you know, so it, he's the sort of monarch uh, of, all he, of all he can see. So once this book came out and became quite popular and sort of a circulating and, and underground um, uh, places in various kinds of ways, he started to raise enough money to try to put some of his projects into motion. And the first one was this one, the Minerva Reefs of the, of the Southwest Pacific. These are reefs that, um, it's two atolls, and they are essentially underwater 22 hours out of the, out of the day. Uh, and then there's enough of a kind of tidal drop that they, they emerge. And they're basically, if you look on a map and you imagine where Fiji and Tonga are, uh, and you look south, you'll see the tip of, of New Zealand. They're in between, right? They're in between Tonga, Fiji, and uh, New Zealand. And the idea for Oliver, with, with a lot of funding and a lot of backing, was to essentially take sand out of the lagoon. You can see one of the, um, uh, one of the lagoons, the atolls there over in the, in the side. That's a Japanese uh, ship that wrecked on the reefs. The reefs were very famous for shipwrecks. Uh, some of them are still there. Um, but the idea was to dredge. They brought a dredging vessel from Australia. They dredged the lagoon, piled sand on the reef then took coral and wrapped it in chicken wire and filled it with concrete to build a platform upon which they build a city that would eventually house 30,000 people. Right? This was the operating premise that they had. Um, you can see they produced a coin, Republic of Minerva, uh, South Pacific Ocean with longitude and latitude on it. This was one of the ways in which they made money. I continue to try to buy one of these on eBay and I always get outbid uh, because, because it is valuable, that it is, it is gold. Um, you can see here what you can guess by looking here in the middle slide what, what happened to this project uh, and what happened to it was the King of Tonga got word of this um, and quickly decided that the country needed to lay claim to uh, the reefs, even though the reefs are outside of Tonga's traditional territorial waters. And, it's, and it's, there wasn't an EEZ at this point, right? It's, this is before 1982. But um, he had enough support, which is really fascinating. Fiji, uh, a number of others, South Pacific nations, all archipelagic, all of them agreed at a South Pacific uh, committee meeting in 1972 that this was unacceptable and that they were going to essentially back Tonga in its claims to the reef for the time being because they didn't want to essentially open up what would look like an ocean rush of just people pouring into whatever seamount, whatever atoll, whatever reef they could find and to kind of build on top of it. So the king of Tonga uh, took his royal yacht and a, a brass band and uh, a group of prisoners actually from the island and they, they sailed down to the Tonga reef they laid claim to it. They took down the small pieces of apparatus that had been already put together by Michael Oliver and his backers. Um, and they asserted uh, a, a kind of territorial right uh, to the reefs and they renamed them. And these stamps, these are stamps that were issued when that uh, happened. And these are two different stamps on an envelope that I got off of eBay. Um, one is the Government Gazette Extraordinary, which is declaring political rights. And the other one is an image of them raising the flag on on the reef uh, when it's uh, above the waterline. It's a little bit idealized there. It's never that qu quite far above the waterline, but, but still. And today, to this day, there's, there's small structures uh, on there that are intended to suggest Tongan uh, oversight of the reefs, although Fiji uh, disputes this. So this didn't go well. So a second project was put into place starting in 1973. Uh, this is a project that's a little more disturbing. I mean, the first one's disturbing in many ways um, in terms of e ecology, but also politics uh, and, uh, and colonization and so forth. But the Bahamas was slated for independence in 1973. And um, the northernmost islands of the Bahamas, Abaco, uh, places where a lot of, um, uh, of whites uh, on Abaco traced their genealogy to loyalists to the British Empire who fled North America after the revolution and, um, and fled the 13 colonies and they went to Abaco. Uh, they did not want to become part of the independent Bahamas. And they were very clear about this. They didn't want to because they didn't want to come under a black government. And it was clear that Pendling's government was going to win the elections and there was going to be a black independent government in Bahamas. They didn't want that, and so they first asked to remain a part of the Bahamas, uh, or to remain a part of the United Kingdom, uh, and that was rejected uh, by 
uh, by the British Parliament. Um, so they then looked at secession, at the possibility of secession. And this is brought to Michael Oliver's attention by uh, an investment specialist who had a very prominent newsletter in the 1970s named Harry Schultz. Margaret Thatcher was one of his subscribers. Um, he was, he was a, a fairly big wig. He used to run these three-day workshops in, uh, in uh, Freeport in the Bahamas. And uh, it was brought to Oliver's attention, and he ended up allying here with uh, the man on the far right you see there uh, with the mustache and the beret. Uh, that's Mitchell Livingston Werbel III. Uh, Werbel was an extremely fascinating character. I can't go into a lot of detail about him here. I go into a lot of detail about him in the book, but he was in the OSS, the precursor to the CIA. He was in the OSS in Southeast Asia with E. Howard Hunt, who would be one of the lead CIA agents in the coup d'etat uh, in Guatemala in 1954 that overthrew Jacobo Arbenz. He would also be a Watergate plumber uh, and, as well and went to prison along with G. Gordon Liddy. Um, he also wrote fiction, you know, if you're into like uh, um, interesting adventure fiction, he wrote some interesting adventure fiction. Um, he was also, Werbel was also in Southeast Asia with Lucien Conan. Lucien Conan was the um, was a French paratrooper in the OSS, had a big sort of larger than life reputation, um, and went on to go to Vietnam during the Vietnam War and became the through man, the sort of point person for the Kennedy administration when the assassination of Diem in South Vietnam was, was kind of green lighted. Uh, he then became the, one of the directors of, uh, one of the first directors of the DEA when it was created as the DEA in the early 1970s. And he was accused, uh, he didn't last that long in the position. He was accused of running an assassination team to take out high-level drug traffickers. Uh, and so there's, you know, Conan is one of these very, again, like Werbel, uh, one of these characters that lives in this kind of strange, noir, underground world. Werbel himself had a huge compound in, outside of Atlanta in Powder Springs where he, he ran mercenary training schools. He was also a, um, a kind of master tinker, so he created the silencer for the deadliest submachine gun of the 20th century, the Ingram Mac 10 If you read Joan Didion, she talks about the Mac 10 repeatedly. Um, it's, it shows up in lots of movies. Max von Sydow is carrying an Ingram Mac 10 when he uh, is trying to assassinate Robert Redford and uh, Faye Dunaway in Three Days of the Condor. Uh, John Wayne is using an Ingram Mac 10 with a Werbel silencer in the, when he plays the Seattle cop McHugh. James Caan, the killer elite, uh, is carrying an Ingram Mac 10 with a Werbel silencer. Uh, it's pervasive, it's everywhere, including also in various countries around the world, Thailand, Uganda, Vietnam, Israel, Philippines. Uh, and so he was, he was someone who was creating these silencers with Gordon Ingram and, and producing them and marketing them out to the world. And he and Oliver allied uh, with some former CIA characters uh, who I won't go into detail now, but they allied and essentially the idea was to support the secessionist movement in Abaco um, set up what you can see here, an Abaco National Land Trust in which all of the land of Abaco, except for 2% of it, all of it would essentially be uh, privatized and you would have a certificate uh, of title uh, for the land. But it was essentially a kind of, an effort to make a, um, a kind of ideologically glorified homeowners association, right? Uh, or common interest development or something like this. But then to, to bring in all of the constitutional apparatus that Oliver wanted to put into place. The um, middle picture, by the way, a lot of the information that I have about this project and about Mitchell Werbel, a lot of it comes from Freedom of Information Act files that I got from the FBI. The CIA has never complied with any of my requests, but I did get a lot of stuff from the FBI. But the other person I got a lot of stuff from is the archives of Andrew St. George, who's the journalist sitting with Fidel Castro there. And that picture is taken by Che Guevara. So Guevara was a, uh, an avid photographer and he would borrow St. George's camera to take pictures. This is in 1958 uh, before the revolution. So this is in the mountains when there are still rebels attempting to overthrow Batista. And uh, St. George spent off and on close to a year uh, in the mountains with uh, Castro and, and, and Guevara and then ended up um, uh, doing a lot of work on anti-Castro um, uh, resistors in South Florida. Uh, and, um, and that's how he came into contact with Mitchell Werbel and then started uh, doing a lot of reporting on, on, on Mitchell Werbel. Uh, there's a quote I have that, <laughs> that's so interesting in, in St. George's files, so his archives are at Yale. 
uh, he writes to his editors at a certain point and says, I just can't, you know, I can't take it. The, the drunken rambling uh, of Werbel is agonizing. I mean, agonizing was a ferocious drinker, Werbel was, and smoker. Um, and, uh, and he said, it's, you know, it's agonizing, but, you know, I can't resist because every time I talk to him and every discussion with him, there are these gems embedded in the conversation like gold teeth in the shit of a man-eating tiger. <laughs> That's the, that's the quote. I mean, it, that's, so it's this extraordinary recognition of Werbel's, the way Werbel supports his journalistic aims at a time when he's in a, you know, suffering in terms of finances. This project uh, fell apart because the FBI got involved. The FBI started tracking. Uh, there was concerns around um, the kind of activity that they were engaged in and whether or not they were actively attempting to sort of you know, in, involve themselves in a foreign government's uh, activities. So the last project I'll talk about very quickly, New Hebrides and Santo Island, now, now the country of Vanuatu. Um, again, you can see a gold coin was made, freedom and self-government, right? a very classic libertarian phrase. You can see actually in the blue flag at the back there with the hands shaking, you know, it says individual rights for all. Right? Uh, so the man in the white shirt is Jimmy Stevens. And Jimmy Stevens was a chief on the island of Santo. So Santo was jointly colonized by the British and the French under an agreement known as the condominium. The locals called it the pandemonium. Um, and uh, they were slated gradually for independence in, in 1980, but there was a lot of sort of machinations by the French and the British around how this was going to uh, unfold. And you had a division open up on the, uh, on the archipelago of Vanuatu between Anglophone anti-colonials, uh, the New Hebrides National Party, and uh, the movement that was headed by Jimmy Stevens called Nagri Amel. And essentially, Stevens began to realize in the late 1970s that he was kind of losing out uh, to the New Hebrides National Party. And so what he did is allied himself. He met Michael Oliver in Fiji. Uh, in the early 1970s, they ran into each other and started to have conversations. And so he allied himself with Oliver, and Oliver helped Oliver and a couple of other people with him, including John Hospers, who was a philosophy professor at the University of Southern California, described in one FBI document as a fringe thinker of the Ayn Rand school. I was like, oof, that's just, that's, that's like triple uh, dagger. Um, so he, they, they, collaborated, essentially. And this is an instance in which um, it, it got much worse than these other projects already were because there was a, a rebellion in 1980, the Santo Rebellion, led by Jimmy Stevens, uh, financed and backed by Michael Oliver, Hospers, uh, a guy from Australia, Richard King, uh, another man by the name of F. Thomas Eck, who would eventually go to prison for pump and dump internet, internet uh, schemes. Um, and so, you know, this led, to, uh, this led to the death of Jimmy Stevens, one of his sons, and it led to the displacement of a couple of thousand of, of Nivanuatu on the island of Santo. It fractured the community. Uh, it delayed independence. Uh, and so it had, a, it, it had a, a, a terribly wrenching effect. Jimmy Stevens went to prison for nearly 14 years. Um, in the meantime, you know, the libertarian exiters who were trying to set up a special economic zone in a private city on Santo just went back. Carson City and Los Angeles and, and San Francisco. Uh, at this point, Oliver kind of says, I'm done with this. Uh, and he, he stops with the projects in the 1980s. A lot of these projects that were very prominent in the 60s and 70s don't continue into the 80s, I think in part because you could socially secede from society with the Thatcher-Reagan kind of transformations that were taking place. I mean, that's oversimplified, but I do think there's something about those years that makes it uh, a different um, a different situation for people interested in these projects. But in the 1990s, he starts to investigate some of these projects again and starts giving uh, talks to groups of people who are interested in kind of resuscitating some of these. The last two chapters in the book, I move to more contemporary projects, but not the kind of exaggerated exit that I mentioned. And the two I look at are seasteading and free private cities. Seasteading started in 2008 with uh, the creation of what was called the Seasteading Institute in San Francisco. It was funded by a large uh, investment from Peter Thiel, the very famous libertarian iconoclast from Silicon Valley, runs Palantir, um, amongst other things, uh, early investor in Facebook and so forth. Um, and it was started in 2008, and it was directed initially by Patry Friedman, the grandson of Milton Friedman. And the idea here was to create on the so-called high seas of the open ocean uh, floating uh, independent sovereign platforms. 
Um, and there was, you know, lots and lots and lots. This is very aspirational, and there were lots of questions around this. What does international law say about something like this? It wasn't, it wasn't actually entirely clear. Uh, engineering questions, you know, you can't fix it to the, to the um, ocean floor because it's too deep, and so how do you ballast? Um, how do you deal with, you know, rogue waves and, and food? And, but, of course, the big question is labor, uh, and, and the labor costs were uh, outrageous. In recent years, the Seasteading Institute has kind of come closer to shore. They, they tried to set up a, a fixed uh, um, platform in a lagoon in Tahiti, and that didn't go very well. There was a lot of resistance to that, and that didn't happen. Uh, and they're still though, operating. They're doing a lot of work now in Panama. Um, one of the interesting things, I think, that comes out of the book for me is that places that we often think of as, you know, off the beaten track, small, maybe if you're not being very generous, backward. Um, these places are hyper-modern. This is where all the modern experiments are happening. Honduras, Panama, Vanuatu, uh, the open ocean. That's where the hyper, hyper, that's, if you want to know the future, I think that's where you look at, at what's happening. Not just for climate change, but also all of these kinds of uh, experimentations. Um, and so seasteading is one that's ongoing. You can go to the Seasteading Institute site and, 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 and see, their, uh, see their stuff. Uh, the other one is free private cities uh, in Honduras. And so there was a coup d'etat in Honduras in uh, 2009. And these began with uh, an economist named Paul Romer. Romer was an economist at Stanford. He was chief economist at the World Bank for a short period of time in 2018. Uh, and he's now at NYU, and he gave a TED talk where he talked about charter cities. And the idea here was that traditional forms of international aid don't work very well. So in, uh, instead, what you could do is actually have a government cede a piece of its sovereign territory, build a new city from scratch. Um, and of course, the premise here is that it's vacant land, which is super problematic. Um, you could build a city from scratch and have it overseen by uh, a kind of international board. Um, and that it would be a kind of open in, open out city. It's purely contractual. No voting, no voting rights, no unions, nothing like this. You can either sign the contract and join the city. If you don't want to, that's fine. You can go away and not join the city. Uh, this got a lot of attention from the coup regime in Honduras. These were people that were quite interested in this. Uh, they found these ideas quite interesting uh, for a variety of reasons, which I go into into the book. Um, and then there was a lot of people that tried to get in on the ground floor very quickly. And these, these things changed very quickly over time. They started to turn into special economic zones. There were efforts by the Honduran Congress and by the Supreme Court to stop these from going forward. And there was intimidation. There were murders and executions of attorneys uh, under the coup regime. And uh, it got quite bad. Uh, the ZAs have not gone forward, uh, especially in, in, in recent times because of a change of the government. But there is one that's still kind of ongoing on the island of Roatan, which is the Bay Islands in, in, on the, in the Caribbean coast of Honduras. That one's still kind of ongoing. There's a lot of players involved in this. Um, you can see, you know, I put up some of the um, uh, Silicon Valley tech libertarian culture. I mean, you had a lot of the tech people involved. So Patry Friedman again, a guy by the name of Michael Strong. Um, but you also have a lot of ex-Reagan officials who kind of cut their teeth on Central American policy. Faith Whittlesey, Grover Norquist, the anti-tax guy, um, Skousen, um, I'm trying to remember his first name. His uncle's name is Cleo, Cleon Skousen, who was a um, pretty terrifying uh, guy in Salt Lake City. Uh, but Skousen was a CIA and then also a, an international investor um, with, a, with a kind of portfolio and, and so forth. Uh, Mark Klugman, uh, very prominently, uh, who was uh, affiliated with the Cato Institute, also worked on Jose Piñera's municipal election campaign in in Chile in the late 1990s, Pineda was the architect of Pinochet's labor uh, code. Um, and so you can, see, you can start to see the networks. There's a big network, the Atlas Foundation, of very conservative libertarians uh, that have connections with authoritarian, in my opinion. Uh, you can start to see some of the networks. Last, I'll just say a couple of last things here. Futuristic, but still more analog than digital. They're still talking about territory and sovereignty. It's an old story. It's an old story. It's Wakefield's New Zealand company. I mean, it's, a, it's an old story. Um, it's the next phase of neoliberal to libertarian revolution. 
So there's social secession, but also territorial secession. A lot of this looks like a private gated community. I mean, it could be Sandy Springs, Georgia. Uh, you know, uh, certainly the, the current thing going on north of San Francisco, Solano County, uh, you know, it, it's, they're just gonna pave over agro. I mean, if they, if they can, they're gonna pave over agricultural land and make, a, a, make an HOA or something. It's not gonna be some kind of fantastic ecotopia. Um, they experiment with legal and political systems. Uh, so there's a guy, a, a legal scholar by the name of Tom Bell at Chapman University who's produced a kind of, um, um, uh, a kind of system where you can mix and match civil and common law uh, and create certain kinds of uh, idiosyncratic legal systems for these communities. He's worked with the groups in Honduras. He's worked with the Seasteading Institute and others. There's a lot of use of blockchain and cryptocurrency in this. Uh, there's, there's something called Satoshi Island off the, coast of, um, off the coast of Vanuatu, which isn't going anywhere, as we all knew it wouldn't. Um, there's Balaji Srinivasan's The Network State, uh, amongst other things that I won't go into here. The, I'll just say, you know, the, the Gibson Neuromancer quote, I mean, there's a lot of sci-fi stuff um, in all of this, but I really think the person who nails it in terms of sci-fi is, is the British author, J.G. Ballard, whose image of sci-fi in the future is that it's gonna be really boring and it's gonna look a lot like what we have now, except worse and more unequal. And I think he's absolutely right. I think Ballard, you can, you can mine Ballard's work for uh, this kind of stuff. And then the, this is the last slide, who exit, who has a right to exit, who has a right to remain. It's terrible that in Honduras, these projects are going on. There's people here now, you know, you have these wealthy people looking to essentially create multiple forms of sovereignty to themselves, while a huge number of Hondurans are being made effectively stateless, you know, where their very existence is, is seen as a criminal act. Who pays? Exit is expensive for those who buy in and for those who, who cannot. I mean, it outsources its cost onto the, onto the public with economic and political turmoil, extractivism, extrusionism. Uh, there's a lot of benefits that they get, taxpayer subsidies, corporate welfare, international free trade agreements, uh, and so forth. So these things are not somehow or another just a separation from the rest of us, right? They're, they're, they are much more than that. It's not a neutral act, as Mike Davis uh, has said. There should be no exit option uh, for, uh, the wealthy. And that's the last point I would make is just that, um, to be sort of blunt about it, that preferential exit uh, is not benign withdrawal in the pursuit of autonomy and self-government, which is how they market it, right? Freedom, freedom. Um, but it's, it's actually, uh, you know, just part of the history of class warfare by, by other means. Uh, and that's kind of where I end up in the, uh, in the book at this point. So thanks for listening. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Thanks, my pleasure. Um, do we have questions? And if you'll raise your hand, and I'm gonna bring the microphone to you so that we can catch the question on the recording. Thank you so much um, for sharing this. Um, I'm very curious just because there seems to be a somewhat gendered component to the way in which, as you mentioned at, at the get-go, the sort of white male fantasies of you know, uh, space race, but also in these much more material contexts. I'm wondering if there were any uh, exceptions to this rule, if there were sort of, you know, Anne Rand being the sort of ultimate female libertarian um, extraordinaire, if there were dynamics in which you saw either you know, patriarchal constructs being reproduced in these contexts or um, female protagonists who played roles in these projects? Yeah, thanks. So it's interesting, the, the earlier projects are, I think, in some ways, uh, stereotypically, um, I mean, I hate to say it this way, but I, they feel stereotypically libertarian, very male, you know, and the more recent projects, less so. Uh, I mean, the earlier projects you do have, there's, you know, there's, um, there's a number uh, of women involved in the Abaco project, for example, in which they're recruited in to run the kind of front operation out of Miami, where everything is being sort of coordinated uh, and so forth. And these, these are women who are family members of some of the male participants. Um, and so they're kind of, it's, it's a kind of family operation in that respect, I guess, is one way to put it. Um, and the, the family question is a kind of separate one, but I mean, even there, you know, in libertarian writing, there's always this slippage between the individual and the family. 
and social reproduction. And so uh, it, that's never adequately addressed, in my opinion. But anyway, um, that, that's a, an aside. The more recent stuff is interesting. So I went in 2017 to, um, to San Francisco to something called the Startup Societies Foundation meeting. So they have this, there's this organization called the Startup Societies Foundation, and they do these uh, conferences in various places. And it's a, you know, it's a kind of festival of this kind of stuff. And um, not like an Arcopulco, uh, I, should, I should say that. It's not quite that debauched. But, um, but it is a kind of, you know, big gathering of, uh, of maybe 60% of the people there are, uh, are trying to do an initial coin offering on a new digital currency or, or something like this, or they're trying to sell some kind, something related to the blockchain. The other 40% are, 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 you know, essentially having these big conversations about this kind of stuff and trying to spark the imagination. And I was amazed because I got there and it, it was probably maybe 40, 60, the gender split, which was much, many more women than I expected. And I certainly think the contemporary projects, that's become a central aspect of how they now talk about and market uh, the projects. And so there's a, um, there's a, an effort to talk about the projects as things that address questions of gender inequality, racial inequality, uh, and so forth. Whether or not they actually do is, is another question, but there's a cognizance uh, of this, and, um, and you can actually see it over the course of time. You can, act, you can actually see the shifts in some of the ways that they, that they talk about their projects. And so there were, you know, this 2017 meeting, uh, it, was, it was very interesting because there were a, a lot more speakers on the stage uh, who were women. There were a lot more people uh, involved in a lot of the sort of, not just the kind of sales pitch stuff, but the actual kind of uh, imagining uh, that was going on in the room uh, than I had expected. And that I think sometimes, you know, a subreddit will make you think is, 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 is happening. Um, so yeah, the earlier projects, much less, uh, much less so, yeah, thanks. Kira, and my name's Miranda Johnson. I'm visiting Cornell from New Zealand. <laughs> and I teach Pacific Peter history. Peter Thiel has a passport. Sorry, yeah, and I teach Pacific history. So it's, it's very interesting to see that um, region come up. And, and my question was partly methodological about this. Um, I just read Quinn Slob Slobodian's yeah. book as well. Um, and I'm interested in the way these histories are being written and by connecting these kind of, you know, far out, exceptional, jurisdictionally lumpy kinds of spaces um, in ways that also then kind of abstract them a bit from their regional histories. And right. I wonder um, if you could speak to that methodological choice, because I suppose these other things obviously going on with Vanuatu and Tonga in relation to New Zealand and Australia, right. um, you know, and, and some of us in New Zealand and Australia are now trying to much more carefully replace those settler contexts back in their Pacific yeah. histories in ways that might speak back to some of the history that you're, you know. Yeah. So I'm kind of interested in those sorts of tensions around island, yeah. island, islanded kind of histories and, and regional ones as yeah. well. Yeah, no thanks, I really appreciate that. Um, so there's a couple of things I would say, uh, I didn't you know, go into detail here, but uh, there's, there's, a, um, there's a group of Australian investors who are in these projects all the way along, right? All the way from Tonga, all the way up to Vanuatu, and even after. I mean, I think I mentioned one, Richard King, but there's an, a, there's an architect in Adelaide, there's an array of individuals who are uh, involved from, from Australia, and to some degree from New Zealand. There were also uh, Australian investors trying to do something similar with a casino on, Con on the Conway reefs. Uh, and so that's part of the reason that they chose the Minerva reefs. They didn't want to compete. Uh, um, but yes, I mean, so there's two things I would say. One is, is that part of, part of what was interesting for me was just to use Oliver and his projects and just to follow him around the globe, but then to realize just how much it was a history of looking for places that are decolonizing in a very, very active way. Most of them British in some form or another. I mean, you know, New Hebrides is British and French, but the Bahamas. He wrote something called a, the Capitalist Country Newsletter, and he, you go through it, and he, could, he maps out all the places that he's gone. And 
you know, Honduras reappears over and over again. Um, you know, Suriname, Curaçao. I mean, he was really looking around all over the place, but he kept coming back to places that were under previous British control. So that was, that was part of it. it. Was For me, it was kind of a map of, of decolonizing spaces. The island stuff, uh, absolutely. Uh, I think it's, you know, it, it's very predictable. And I think part of it is a kind of imagination at work that goes back to Robinson Crusoe and Thomas More. Um, and, you know, they kind of reproduce Crusoe-esque visions of the island and the individual in their writing. Um, and then I think, uh, uh, part of it also is this sense in which, you know, islands are, in some sense, uh, places of possibility that even in an archipelago, they can, they can essentially kind of exclude themselves in some ways. In the chapter on Tonga, one of the things I tried to do, and I spent some time on at the end of the chapter, is trying to very strongly point out that uh, it's not only that, that the reefs are just not there for the taking, but it's also that the reefs actually have an enormous amount of meaning to ocean-going societies. And so these are places of seasonal fishing rights. There are negotiated arrangements between Fiji and, and Tonga around these reefs. There's open ocean outrigger canoeing. I mean, the Pacific Ocean is not an empty, vast space waiting to be colonized. I mean, these are 2,000 years of people navigating uh, these spaces and building connections and relationships and so forth. And so I try to um, spend some, some serious time uh, dedicated to that because it, it's not just the kind of geopolitical context, it's a cultural context, and it's also, uh, I mean, the Minerva Reefs, one of the things I didn't mention is that in 1962, uh, there's a Tongan cutter that's carrying, a, you know, a sort of medium-sized ship that's carrying a group of Tongan boxers to go to Sydney. And something happens, and it's not clear exactly what. There's in interesting reporting about it, but they wreck on the Minerva Reef. But nobody expected them to wreck because the reefs had been charted. And so they realized that no one's going to go looking for them at the reefs. They're going to think they, they, they just sank someplace else. And three of the people aboard the ship die and are buried on the reef uh, in 1962. And then the captain of the, uh, his name was Tevita Felita, he uh, they build a, a makeshift outrigger canoe and paddle him and his son and the ship's carpenter to Fiji. And, uh, and then a lot of them are rescued. His son dies actually trying to shore in Fiji. And it's this huge moment and the queen writes a poem and there's a, there's a chanting of the poem that's really spectacular. But I mean, this is, you know, this is not a place where you just come and build an island, build a city. You know, I mean, there's, there's the bodies of ancestors, the bodies of friends and family members on those, on those reefs. These are places where, so I tried very much to kind of bring that to, to life. Um, yeah, so anyway, that, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm Mina. Um, real quick, what happened with the Bahamas after uh, Oliver's project didn't work? Was there... A secession? Was there civil war, et cetera? Yeah. So uh, no, um, <laughs> you, you you had a, a split amongst the independence movement in Abaco, uh, and there was a group that realized what they might be getting themselves into um, with Mitchell Werbel. One of the people I didn't mention behind the scenes in all of this was a British lord. Uh, Lord Stenton in Belhaven, um, family motto, ride through. Uh, it, seriously, that's the family motto. Um, have to have a family motto. Uh, he was a lord who uh, was a backer of this project. Um, and so he's someone I didn't mention. There was a lot of backers to these projects that I didn't mention. And um, so there's two, there's two secessionist movements. And one of them very quickly is like, we don't want any, any part of this. It's going to be violent. It's not going to be good. We're not interested. And there's an, another movement that that persists, but once the FBI gets involved and Werbel gets brought forth on marijuana trafficking charges uh, in 1974, and uh, there's a whole array of kind of things that happened there. And, um, and so that's even that other secessionist movement then essentially, you know, kind of, it, so Abaco remains to this day part of, uh, part of the Bahamas, um, and you don't have the creation of, um, anything like, you know, Freeport on the Grand Bahama, which was the big concern for a lot of people was the building of these kinds of special economic areas, uh, right, that had been built earlier, yeah, so, yeah. I mean, it's a weird overlap because actually a number of Nivanuatu from the island of Santo 
who support Jimmy Stevens, uh, are flown by Harry Schultz to the Bahamas to attend his free market investment seminar. I mean, it's just, you know, it's crazy. Um, anyway, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Um, I'm really looking forward to reading your book. Uh, oh, Biosphere you. 2, where does Biosphere 2 in Arizona fit into your story, if it does at all? Yeah, it doesn't. Um, and I don't know a lot about it. Uh, there are a lot of these kinds of um, varieties of these projects, I think, on, in various um, iterations. And uh, I was never quite clear about, you know, the, what I wanted to do is make sure I stayed where I was comparing apples with apples. Um, and then I think there's a kind of, you know, so the, the, even the one I mentioned about Northern California, Solano County currently, um, I wouldn't situate that here in, this, in exactly the same way. It's been stripped of its kind of libertarian rhetoric. It's, uh, they themselves have tried to be, the promoters of it have tried to be very um, sort of direct about uh, it's not going to be a closed community and, and uh, they don't have this kind of aspiration of, uh, of a certain kind of ideological position in theory. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure about biosphere at all uh, and I apologize. I wish I could answer that question. We are kind of out of time. <laughs> and I know that some of us want to go to see N.K. Jemison, right? Yes. Um, so let me just say a few things, if, if you don't mind. Um, so first of all, I want to thank you very much. Thank you. I for your it. great Thanks. talk. And also thank the audience for joining us today and coming. Um, the recorded version of today's talk will be available on the CUL YouTube channel in a couple of weeks if you want to share it with friends and family who couldn't make it today. Um, the next chat in the stacks will be October 19th at 4 p.m. on Zoom and at Mann Library and is going to feature the book, The Courage to Learn, Honoring the Complexity of Learning for Educators and Students by Marsha Ames Sheevely. So with that, have a wonderful evening, everyone, and uh, take care. Thanks. Thanks, Virginia.